There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Ian. Um, I, I've been working on a project called All the Places for the last few years, um, and I thought I'd let you know about it. This microphone is blocking my view of the screen that I'm supposed to be looking at. Sorry. Um, so what is All the Places? Um, All the Places came from a realization um, that it's really hard to map place data, and so it's kind of a, a hard data, um, a hard type of data to include in OpenStreetMap because um, most data contribution happens when you're looking at the map from the satellite or the aerial image. Um, there are, obviously it's easy to see, or it's easy to collect street level imagery now, but it still is pretty difficult to capture place level detail using that kind of imagery. So what that means is uh, place data generally in OpenStreetMap is pretty bare, and uh, usually it involves you going to the place to gather data. And once you do that, it, um, it can be really tedious to capture and update that because you have to like look at it and uh, understand the opening hours and translate that to the OpenStreetMap format because nobody has quite got the, the interface for that perfect. But anyway, the point is it is um, time consuming to map places. And then on top of that, places are something that change really frequently. Um, the, Min, your, the sandwich place that you went to was brand new as of last year, right? So um, that, that means that there's probably uh, a brand new change in OpenStreetMap with that change. Um, and that only happened because somebody visited who happened to be comfortable with OpenStreetMap. And uh, there's also not really an open, there was not really an open uh, places database. Um, Skylar, uh, is he still here? I, I think we had, that, the, the previous uh, open data set for places was a data set that was put together at least a decade ago and released as public domain. That was, I forgot what that was called, but that was a big, um, kind of an interesting data set. Uh, but it quickly was out of date. And um, Overture recently came out with a data set that, came, that comes from uh, Facebook data mostly, and um, it's really useful and interesting, and it's fairly complete, but it has a pretty limited amount of metadata associated with it. Like in this case, um, there's this uh, bookstore in my neighborhood, and, and you only know that it's a bookstore. Um, it has pretty good confidence that it's a bookstore, though. That's good. Um, that I mean, that's super useful, but um, it's not quite the, at the level that OpenStreetMap is expecting. Um, also, the CVS doesn't exist anymore. How do I get rid of that? Uh, um, <laughs> so uh, that leads to all the places. So um, all the places is um, a collection of data scrapers that reach out to the, I, I, I used to have restaurants in this slide, but now it is organizations because it's more than just restaurants. But um, there are places uh, that companies organizations that want uh, people to know where their businesses are, and they'll put those on the internet, usually in a really nice way, uh, a nice format, uh, with location and all sorts of metadata attached to them, but they're all in unique uh, APIs and websites and templates, and they have pictures in different places, and so all the places is designed to capture that data, scrape it into a, a standard format. And I got ahead of myself here a little bit. So um, on the on this slide here, this is Starbucks's representation of their locations, and then um, this is all the places representation of everyone but Starbucks location because the Starbucks scraper broke. But anyway, um, the the idea is that all the places is gathering this kind of data into uh, a single data set. Um, all the places started off as a a uh, single little Python script that would go and grab Culver's restaurant locations. Um, Culver's beats anybody, any fast food chains, burgers, hands down. I'll fight you on that. Um, <laughs> and so I wanted to make sure all those Culver's locations uh, ended up in OpenStreetMap. 
Um, Culver's was what I chose because I was sitting in a Culver's parking lot while I was thinking about this, but also because Culver's releases their locations as a CSV. Um, and ironically, Culver's and, um, there, well, there's a few other restaurants that do that because like RV people will import that into their Garmin GPS and use that as a really quick way of adding uh, points to their map, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and so that, that was back in 2016 or 17 or something like that. And um, I ended up with a little script that kind of matched OpenStreetMap Culver's with the scraped Culver's. And I ran that periodically. And then um, I was working at Mapsen and we needed more places to search. Uh, we had good data for addresses. We wanted to be able to search for place data as well. And we couldn't find any good places to search. So I started scraping things. And um, it kind of came out of, out of the same mindset as open addresses, if you have heard of that. So um, the other nice part about uh, the Mapsen situation or connection was that we had this huge spike of contributions in 2018. That was related to Mapsen shutting down. Um, we worked really hard to spend as much money on gathering more scrapers at that time. Um, but more recently, um, the last couple of years, there have been a, there's been an increasing and large amount of traffic from people who uh, are affiliated with companies and not affiliated with companies who are just trying to add uh, to this data collection. And I believe that we're at something like 2,600 scrapers now. We started off with one, and we're at 2,600 now. And um, 2,500, sorry. And um, the data gets re-scraped every week, and um, it gets added to this list of ever-expanding list of uh, scrapes. You can download each of those data files as a zip file of GeoJSON objects. And um, you can also look at the map. I sort of screenshot of that earlier. Um, then on the bottom of the screen here, these are, it's basically the historical spider count and scraper count and the number of features in each run. So this is an example of what the output looks like. Um, the output is one GeoJSON feature collection per spider. It's got a whole bunch of attributes. We recently uh, settled on uh, merging in with a uh, name suggestion index. So we get some OpenStreetMap tags in here. We normalize the phone number. We have some code to convert um, opening hours format or opening hours strings into uh, OpenStreetMap uh, opening hours format. We grab image and website and all sorts of things automatically. Um, and um, all of that stuff ends up in a GeoJSON feature collection for you to either merge together into one big output or treat uh, as a, a, a thing that you can work on per brand. Um, each of the spiders is MIT licensed, meaning you can do whatever you'd like with them. Um, there are definitely people who use these spiders to uh, build other spiders to, uh, they run very specific collections of data <coughs> um, uh, beyond what we do. And um, for example, I, uh, you might remember back in 2017 or something, um, there was a discussion of uh, getting rid of a bunch of uh, USPS collection boxes. And so I started running the USPS scraper every five days or something like that. And I have a Git repo with all of the USPS collection boxes going back to whenever I, whatever date I started at. And so you can look at the historical data for some of this data as well. The data itself that we go and fetch is CC0 licensed. So you can import it into OpenStreetMap if you like. But you probably shouldn't because uh, you should make sure and check with the community around you and make sure you're merging in with uh, existing data. And um, so there's other wider uses of this kind of data. Um, I forgot who set this up, but there's a map roulette challenge that will go and check OpenStreetMap and, and compare it with um, what we have in all the places. And you can say, uh, they'll call out places in OpenStreetMap that are missing. And 
uh, you can really quickly and easily add that to OpenStreetMap. So it's kind of like my Culver's example, but across all the brands and all the scrapers that, uh, that we have. And then there's a more specific regional version of that called Chain Reaction that uh, operates specifically, I think, just in the UK that um, has a more programmatic way of, uh, of tackling that where they'll uh, ask you if this place matches this OpenStreetMap place, and if you say yes, it will do the, the OpenStreetMap change. Um, and then, of course, there are people who are using this to uh, check their places data that they already have, uh, because in theory, this data should be uh, ground-ish truth, uh, meaning that it's coming from the Starbucks themselves, so it probably exists. Um, there is some lag in the data that they produce, but um, it's probably pretty darn good. And then, um, of course, you can all come and join. Um, it's really easy to add spiders and, and scrapers. Um, uh, I keep using those words interchangeably. A spider is basically a nicer word for a scraper. There's just different, that's what the uh, uh, Python code that we use calls a scraper. Um, but there's all sorts of uh, library code now that helps you find, um, it basically outputs a spider for you, the code. Um, if you give it a website, it will say, hey, this uh, website looks like a Yelp page, and we'll tell you how to go grab that. And you can just copy it and paste that into a pull request and push it up to GitHub. Um, and then the really cool thing is that when you file a pull request, um, we run that code and show you a map of the, of the places that you scraped, and we, that's how we check to make sure that it works before we merge it. And then um, there, so if you don't have a particular spider in, or a place in mind, um, you can look at the, ex the existing report to see which ones are failing. It's usually pretty obvious. There's like some HTML changed a little bit and you can go and fix that. That's a super easy way. Like if you ever, we participate in the GitHub Hacktoberfest thing. They used to give out t-shirts, but now they plant trees. Um, so <laughs> this is a great way of winning that. Um, and uh, so keep that in mind this uh, October. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for the great presentation. Um, any questions for him? So I know there was one screenshot in there of just the downloads that are available. So do you make this data only available as just a download of the run of every spider? So far, yes. So you can go in there and get each, the, like the GeoJSON is available for each scraped spider, like each spider run. Um, but it, the download link that we present is for the whole thing zipped together. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. We'll see how long it takes me to write some spiders. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So after this is run for a period of time, how much work would be involved in using it as a stream of places that you have seen and then seen disappear that could be a feed for open historical map? Yeah, good, good question. So I think um, one of the things that we had a good discussion about in the community uh, maybe six months ago was how we decide when a place is closed versus when the chain goes out of business versus when uh, there's an error in their data. Um, so far, we haven't really been able to nail that difference down programmatically, but um, there is a couple years of data here, weekly data, and so you could go through and say, this place uh, disappeared out of the data stream, and you could flag that as a thing that needs to get deleted. Um, so far, that doesn't happen. It would be fairly easy to do, though, because you just check this once a week and look for deletions, and then look to see if the place still exists in OpenStreetMap, and add it to Open Historical. Hey, so yeah, um, writing scrapers and spiders sounds really hard. Yeah. So my question is, uh, maybe some of these recent advances in like large language models or AI, maybe could that be beneficial at going out to these websites and maybe replace some of that fragile code? Yeah. So that's a really good call. I think. 
Um, I've experimented with that a little bit. Um, the difficulty there is it's actually pretty easy to write these scrapers still. Like it's the, the tipping point hasn't been reached yet. Where it's, where it's not the case is with small mom and pop shops where everybody's got their own, like they pick their own stripe or square uh, template and they like move something around. They put a thing in a PDF instead of on HTML. Um, I don't have a solution for that yet. I think LLMs would work really well if we could go through something like the, um, the giant scrape of the internet that happens. I forgot what that's called. But um, that kind of collection of data could then, we could go fetch the data and pass it through LLM and get useful data out for smaller shops like that. But it's fairly easy to do still for large places, like large chains. Um, in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next presentation, but we'll Sounds have some good. time uh, in the next break. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ian, again.